Uh, what I have to share with you is not a message of legalism or law or condemnation. It's a message of life. Uh, you know, if I had to liken it to something, I guess I would say it's kind of like a, a spiritual pep talk. You know how a coach will gather all of the, the team uh, in the dugout at halftime or maybe before the game, and he'll say, hey, guys, there's a lot on the line. This is the last of the season. We want to finish strong. I want you to remember this, 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 this. Watch out for that. Watch out for the other, right? Now let's get out there and win the game. That's the spirit in which this message is coming tonight, and I hope you'll receive it as such. I want to talk to you about the coming reward, the coming reward. You know, throughout my uh, tenure as a minister, I've had the opportunity to be a commencement speaker uh, at various Bible graduation ceremonies and commencement services, both here in America and also uh, in other nations of the world. And of course, we were gathered in those uh, particular ceremonies to acknowledge and to reward people for their academic accomplishments. But many times as I stood before uh, those students cognizant of the fact they were about to receive a diploma, I would reflect upon the reality that one day, and I believe one day soon, every single one of us will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who will at that time reward all of those who have been faithful to obey him and to carry out his kingdom purposes in the earth. You know, I think it's vitally important that we understand and, uh, and assess, and, and very soberly so, the times in which we're living, how quickly this dispensation is coming to a close, and why we do what we do as believers, why we live as we live uh, as the body of Christ and as members of, of the family of God. In second, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writing, verses 16 through 18, he said, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, frighten one another with these words. Is that what it says? No. It says, comfort one another <laughs> with these words. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm anticipating that day. It's a day that I have looked forward to since I was a child, a seven-year-old Baptist boy born again. I used to jump up and down and say, Mom and Dad, wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus came today? And friends, I still feel that way. Anybody with me? Ooh. So I believe in its imminent reality. Not only is Jesus Christ coming to catch away this glorious church, to ultimately bind Satan, to restore righteousness and justice in the earth, but the Bible says that when he comes, he's bringing something with him. Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 14. Notice Jesus speaking, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Blessed are those that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. As I said, man, that's a day that I'm looking forward to. I think it should be a constant reflection in the hearts and the minds of every Christian, of uh, that one day, immediately following the catching away of the church, will occur what we term the great tribunal of the church, or more specifically, the judgment seat of Christ, one of the greatest award ceremonies you have ever witnessed in your life. I know that when we say the word judgment, it has a tendency to make people nervous, but I want you to understand that the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with one's salvation. It is not the time or place where one's eternal destination will be determined, heaven or hell. That will have been predetermined while on the earth, in the body, through personal uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, the judgment seat of Christ isn't to be confused with the great white throne judgment that will occur at the consummation of the millennial rule and reign of Christ and is reserved primarily uh, for the wicked dead. 
The judgment seat of Christ is exclusively for believers, for you and for me, and it is the place and the time where our deeds and our acts uh, while upon the earth will be examined and we will be rewarded accordingly. Those actions of obedience, service, faithfulness, love, etc., People tend to get excited, you know, about the Emmy Awards. I don't necessarily, but the Emmy Awards, the Grammy Awards, the Tony Awards, the Oscars. And of course, those are ceremonies where people are recognized and awarded for uh, their particular giftings and abilities and maybe uh, acting, script, theater, music, etc. But how many of you know one day you and I are going to be uh, receiving a reward for acting also? acting like the Bible was true and living our lives in accordance with it because it is. Their reward is temporary. Ours will be eternal. Their walk down that red carpet will pale in comparison to our walk down the streets of gold with a crown of righteousness on our head. Can you say amen? Amen. So Paul speaks of this occasion several times in the New Testament, one of which is in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Notice he said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. So the reality is, once again, you understand your sins are covered through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is works. This is reward. And so our deeds and our works will be evaluated, and uh, uh, the reward, of course, can be increased. Or, Paul said, anything that we've done for pride, self-agenda, the accolades of men, that will be, as they term it, uh, uh, wood, hay, and stubble. And he said, that'll be burned up. So none of us want a bonfire at the judgment seat, right? (laughs) Brother Marty, poof. No, we don't want that right? But everything that we've done for the kingdom of God, because we love God, we love people, the Bible says that we'll be uh, rewarded for it. So at that moment, guys, when I'm looking at him face to face and you likewise, what other people thought about my works or my deeds will be of no consequence. It will be exclusively his judgment, and his opinion that counts. It won't necessarily matter how many trophies I have on the shelf, what kind of car I drove, clothes I wore, or house I lived in, or how much money I had in the bank. Although we understand it isn't an infraction against kingdom living to have and enjoy those things in this life. But at that moment... The only considerations will be, did I please you? Did I obey you? Did I apprehend the things that you apprehended me for? Did I run the race that you marked out for me to run, or did I pursue my own interests, my own agenda, my own comfort, my own pleasure? Did I serve you, and did I serve others with a willing heart? Did I reach the the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Was I kind to others? Did I love my neighbor as I love myself? Did I love you with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength? These are the kinds of questions that we will be rehearsing at that moment. And the only way that you and I can answer those questions with an affirmative yes is if we live our lives now with a very clear sense of purpose and direction and live this earthly life with an eternal and heavenly perspective. Are you with me? So, you know, it's easy, isn't it, to become consumed with our natural life? to become so preoccupied with all the voices and the commotion of this present age and forget what this life and our journey through this life is really all about. The Bible likens our life as a Christian as a race that we're running. Guess what? It isn't a sprint. It's not the long jump. 
is a marathon. And so as a believer, we've got to pace ourselves. We've got to discipline ourselves. We got to talk to ourselves and encourage ourselves when necessary. We've got to keep our, our focus. So this evening at the Holy Spirit's direction, I just want to give you some keys that you can implement, all of us can implement as a believer, uh, that will optimize our spiritual endurance and help to ensure that we run this race well and that we finish strong. Are you ready for your pep talk? I call these things, uh, these keys, things to keep. Things to keep. If you're taking notes on your phone or whatever, you can uh, jot these down. But the first one uh, is found in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Wherefore, seeing that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, endurance, steadfastness, right, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The first thing I want to encourage you to keep as we run this final stretch of, of the race cognizant of the fact that this dispensation is closing, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, anyone who uh, is involved in competitive racing or enjoys running, uh, they'll tell you that the moment you take your eyes off the finish line, you take your eyes off the goal. You lose your sense of focus and purpose and you begin to get distracted by the people around you and the things around you is the very moment that you limit your ability to run that race successfully. Uh, you know, we say, keep our eyes on Jesus. Now notice I didn't say our fellow Christian, co-worker, family member, right? Now, the reason we don't say that is because people can become very distracting if we allow them to be. None of us are perfect. We all have areas that we can work on, and if we're not careful, we can begin to zero in on what we perceive to be maybe the faults and the shortcomings of the people that are around us, and we can begin to allow their behavior to influence our attitudes, and our outlook. That's why uh, the Bible says, keep your eyes on Jesus. There's always going to be potential distractions as we run this race. Satan is a master of distraction. Things are going to happen in life. They're going to happen in the world. They're going to happen in our personal lives. They're going to happen in our church life. They're going to happen in our family life, our work environment. But what are we going to do if we're going to obtain the prize and the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and finish well? We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. I know people that haven't entered the doors of a church for 20 years because someone offended me at church. Where are your eyes? In the wrong place, right? Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. Notice the Bible says... Keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all the sideshow distractions. <laughs> and boy, there's plenty of those going on right now. Watch your step. Not your neighbor's step, right? Watch your step and the road will stretch out smooth before you look neither to the right nor the left. So re-emphasizing this point, keeping our eyes on Jesus, I want to look once again at Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 in the Message Bible because it brings a little more clarity. Notice, do you see then what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans of the faith looking on, talking about the great cloud of witnesses, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running. That just means get rid of the things that are encumbering. Never quit. No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sins. Things that kind of suck the spiritual life out. Keep your eyes on Jesus. 
who both began and finished this race we're in. The same one. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor. Right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again. Item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through. That'll shoot some adrenaline into your souls. <laughs> Don't you like that? He was our example. Maybe you're here tonight and you feel, man, that is me. I just feel like I have been plowing through life, plowing through the last six months, plowing through the last year. Well, you're in good company. Christ had some things to plow through. Just keep plowing, keep moving. You'll come to the end of that field, and it will yield a great harvest. Don't quit. Don't give up, right? Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Everybody say, keep your eyes on Jesus. Oh. The second thing I want to encourage you to keep, team, right? Keep your affections on things above. Keep your affections on things above. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.4, notice, he said, every soldier called to active duty must divorce himself from the distractions of this world so that he may fully satisfy the one who chose him. You know, as we said to you, it's easy for all of us to kind of get entangled and captivated with the affairs of our natural life and to allow the natural things of this world to infiltrate and to occupy our hearts and minds to such a degree that they actually take preeminence over spiritual things. So Colossians chapter 3, you know the, the, the Bible, and I'm just giving you the word tonight. I like the scripture to speak for itself. Colossians 3, 1 through 3, notice, if you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things that are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections, what? Your desires, your pursuits, your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. <clears throat> How many of you have ever heard the old saying, you know, it's, it's possible to be so earthly-minded that we're no heavenly good. But you know the opposite of that is true. It's also possible to be so heavenly-minded we're no earthly good. So what you and I want to do as a believer living in the earth is to learn to bring a balance to that and to live proficiently in both realms. So the way we do that is we prioritize. Are you listening? We prioritize and we keep our affections, our love, our desires, our pursuits, watch this word, primarily, primarily on things above. And don't allow ourselves to become exclusively captivated, right, in the pursuit of the natural or the things of this world. So you notice those two terms, that's the balance, primarily seeking things that are above and not exclusively captivated by the natural world around us. So as a Christian, our perspective in life must be an eternal one. Because this earthly life that you and I are living is, is really a fleeting moment in time in the scope of eternity. The Bible describes our natural lives, and as we get older, how many of you can testify, you know, I, I'm getting older myself, and I realize how fast it goes. The Bible says our lives is like a mist. It appears for a moment, and then it vanishes away. It describes it as a shadow that passes, a flower that fades, grass that withers, all of these analogies show us the brevity of our life, uh, naturally speaking, on this earth. And so keeping our affections on things above, having a proper perspective of this world, 
And making good decisions in light of that perspective is essential. The Apostle John, man, he gives us some great advice along these lines. In 1 John chapter 2, you enjoying your pep talk? (laughs) 1 John chapter 2, notice verse 15 through 17 in the Passion Translation. The Bible says, don't set the affections of your heart on this world or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. For all that the world can offer, the gratification of the flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, the obsession with status and importance, none of these things come from the Father. They're of the world. And this world and its desires are in the process of passing away. But those who love to do the will of God live forever. Wow. Guys, how important is it, and particularly now, that you and I make our decisions in this life based upon the perspective that is set forth in that verse? This world is temporary. This world is passing away. And so in light of that reality, I think it's very important that we ask ourselves the appropriate questions about what we're pursuing in this life and why. Are you with me? There's a lot of things we can do. Gratifications of the flesh, pleasures of sin for a season, and they are pleasurable to the flesh. But once again... As a Christian, I need to make intelligent decisions based upon truth. And the truth is, once again, this world is passing away and everything associated with it except people. People are the only eternal things from a natural perspective that we come in contact with on this earth, right? And so while we're here, we want to do things that carry eternal value. We want to do things now that carry blessing and reward on the other side. We want to impact people's lives in a positive way for the kingdom of God. And you know, being a part of this local church is one way that you can do that because you are impacting people's lives. So we want to make decisions now that carry eternal blessing uh, and, and benefit later. Now, I'm not implying and neither is God that we cannot enjoy this life as natural human beings. Of course we can. Fun, activity, hobbies, entertainment, family, enjoy yourself, right? We're simply saying our primary affections are to be on things above and all others are secondary. So it's content and preoccupation that we're addressing tonight, right? Now, let me end with this on this point, 1 John 2, 15 and 17, once again, in the Message Bible. I love these translations and paraphrases. Uh, But notice, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Now, it's all right to have them. Just don't love them, right? (laughs) There's a difference. Love of the world squeezes out love of the Father, Practically everything that goes on in the world, the things our physical nature and our eyes crave for, wanting uh, our own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, it has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all of its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Woo! That's me and you. Because we're going to do what God wants. And we're set for eternity. Everybody say, keep your affection on things above. Giving you some good keys tonight. Now, the only way that you and I are going to be able to fulfill number two, keeping our affections on on things above, is if we do number three. And that is... Keep your heart with all diligence. 
Keep your heart with all diligence. I want to read you two scriptures from the words of the Lord Jesus concerning the heart of man, and then we'll comment. Matthew 12, 35, notice, a good man out of the good treasure, one translation says good deposits of the heart, brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of the heart brings forth evil things. Notice, good deposits, good things. Evil deposits, evil things. Mark 7, 18 through 23. Let's read this together. This is from the 26th translation, so I've got it up here for you on the screen. Nothing that goes into a man's mouth from the outside can defile him or make him unclean. Talking about, you know, food you eat and so forth. Because it doesn't reach into the heart. It goes into the stomach. It passes out of the body altogether. It is what comes out of a man's heart that pollutes him. For from inside a man's heart come evil thoughts, adultery, theft, murder, jealousy, slander, arrogance. All of these evils issue and proceed from within. Now, what do, do these two verses tell us? They basically say that the heart of man, which is where the spirit and soul connect, it's the cardia. It's the seat of your person, that the heart of man is like a bank account. Whatever you deposit in that account, that and that only will be withdrawn. Our hearts are very fertile field, very fertile soil. Whatever seed is planted into the heart of man, it will uh, germinate, it will develop, it will grow, and it will release the fruit of that seed into uh, the life. Notice Matthew 12, 35 again. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things and likewise the evil man. So sometimes people say to me, Brother Marty, I'm a born again Christian. I'm a new creation in Christ. I love God. But I find myself thinking things, doing things, responding and reacting uh, in ways that are not Christ-like. I don't understand my actions. I don't understand my reactions. Sometimes, man, I just, I just, you know, I'm quick on the draw. I find myself cursing, and here I am, a born-again Christian. What in the world is going on? I don't understand. Well, perhaps I could give you a little insight because it's a little principle I've taught my children, my two daughters, since they were this high. Garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't matter that you're a new creation. All things can become new, but what are you putting in since then? You see what I mean? Garbage in, garbage out. And so uh, we, we have to be careful along these lines. And the reality is the entrance to the, the heart are the eye gates, the ear gates, the meditations and reflections of the mind. Are you listening? So what does that mean? The music we're listening to, the movies that we're watching, full of violence, profanity, vulgarity, sensuality, all of the, the media clips and things that are on social media, full of profanity. Are you listening? Oh, you're casually, casually, casually listening or watching, but what we don't realize, friends, you're planting seed, right? Right? And guess what? The heart is non-discriminatory where seed is concerned. Are you listening? That's my job. I'm the gatekeeper. I have to decide what I'm going to see, hear, and reflect upon. And whatever I give entrance to, guess what? Is going to germinate, develop, grow, and be released into the life and bring forth the fruit of the nature of that seed, whether it be good or evil evil. Does that make sense? So we got to be careful, right? Be attentive. That's why Proverbs says in 423, notice, keep your heart with what? All diligence. Because out of it are the issues of life. One translation says, hey, above everything you guard, guard your heart. Because your heart is the fountain from which your life springs. Right? So 
We've got to be cognizant and, and, and aware. Uh, you know, you might be here tonight and you're saying, man, woo, I hadn't done a very good job of that. Well, I got some good news for you. You can clear the field. You can wash the pot. You know, the Bible says the, the, the word, word of God is like water. You ever had an old, uh, maybe a glass and you have residue of something you drank in the bottom of it and you put it under the faucet and you turn it on full blast and hold it there? What happens? Osmosis. Displacement, we should say. Sorry, displacement. That pressure of that clean water washes out the residue. You can put yourself under the Word of God and begin to inundate yourself with the Word of God, the living Word, and man, plant yourself some new seed and let that old harvest die and you'll find yourself in a new place. Are you with me? So, John G. Lake said this. How many of you have ever heard of John G. Lake? Tremendous man of God. Y'all are a mature body here. He said, if one would be a Christian, I mean a real one, he said. He must close the heart, close the mind, close the being to all that is evil and live with an openness to God only so that the glory of God shines in, but all that is dark is shut out. Amen. Everybody say, let's keep our heart with all diligence. Woo! Come on, team. This is our pep talk. Jesus is coming. We're on the final stretch, right? We want to stand that day with a sense of confidence. It's not works. Salvation's free. I'm trying to get you some good reward. Woo! All right, number four. I only got five, so hang in there. Number four is found in Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now watch. Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The fourth thing I want to encourage you to keep is keep yourself in the love of God. Now, guys, let's, let's admit it. For most of us, that's a full-time job, right? Because uh, we got th things to work on. But John 13, 34, notice these are the words of Jesus. He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Notice he didn't say, a new suggestion I have for you, right? He said, a new commandment, a commandment's a law. Just like we've got natural laws in this natural world that govern our behavior, and we realize that if we... Uh, 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 bypass those laws or there's an infraction against them, we could bear the consequences. I mean, you, you go the speed limit because you know if you don't, you could bear the consequence. And I must admit, I, I have <laughs> digressed in that area a couple of times and suffered the consequence. But the law of love is the same thing. It is a law and it's there for a reason. And notice in 1 John 4, 7, and also 10 through 11, uh, we see the characteristic of this love that Christ has asked us to extend to one another. Beloved, let's love one another. Love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Now watch this, verse 10. This is the nature of the love of God. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he first loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now notice, not that we love God, but he first loved us. Irrespective of our initial spiritual condition, our response to him, our rebellion, our faults and our imperfections. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He loved us unconditionally. So basically he's saying, listen, if I can love you in spite of your infractions, your imperfections, your self-centeredness and unkind words and deeds at times, 
Can't you, for goodness sake, extend that same love and kindness to the people around you? And can we? Yes, we can. None of us are perfect. We've already said that. We're going to make mistakes uh, at times. We're going to potentially respond and react uh, unbecomingly at times or improperly. So will others. But we've got to extend to others the same love that we look to God to extend to us. Right? So we've got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Be patient with folks. Right? Extend grace and mercy. Mark 11, 25 and 26, you know the the verses, Christ talking about uh, the relationship between faith and prayer and love and forgiveness. Watch what he said. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you of your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your failings and shortcomings. Good Lord, man, I need to be on the mercy end. Anybody else with me? (laughs) The Bible says, if you sow judgment without mercy, you'll reap judgment without mercy. I want to be on the mercy end. So we've got to walk in forgiveness. We've got to walk in love. You know, it's easy to allow these little grievances and these offenses that take place in our lives to become what we call roots of bitterness. You remember in Hebrews 12, it talks about roots of bitterness. How many of you know how roots of bitterness develop? By reflection. We encounter the offense the unkind deeds, the unkind words, the inflicted pain. And instead of at that moment letting it drop and letting it go, we start rehearsing it over and over. I mean, cannot believe what they said to me. How they treated me. How dare you? Who do you think you are? And we reflect and we rehearse and we reflect and we rehearse until the offense goes down into the heart and roots of bitterness are formulated. And then it, of course, brings forth that fruit of bitterness. And the Bible says it not only defiles us, but then it starts defiling the people around us, man, because it spews out and it can affect us physically, right? Emotionally, relationally, spiritually. You know, I was 18 years old when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I went off, I was Baptist, and I got baptized in the Holy Ghost in a Catholic Bible study (laughs) during the charismatic renewal. Father O'Brien had been born again, baptized with the Holy Ghost, went with a friend of mine. Anyway, I went off to university there in August, uh, and uh, I'd just been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I was so hungry. And so I'm in my freshman year. I got two roommates, so there's three of us in the room. That's the way they did freshmen. So my two roommates are, are out. They went out somewhere. So, man, I said, I'm going to take this opportunity, and I'm going to, oh, I'm just going to pray in the Spirit and seek God. So I got down on my knees, and I started praying and just worshiping the Lord. Never expected to happen what did happen. Never experienced anything like this in my life. But all of a sudden, my eyes are closed, and I'm seeing into the realm of the Spirit. I have a vision, what a spiritual vision. That's where your eyes are closed, but you're seeing into the Spirit realm. And all of a sudden before me, there was this massive file cabinet. And you know, back in the day when they had the file cabinets and on the outside, they had these labels and you would label what's in the drawer, either alphabetically or topically. Well, all of a sudden in this vision, it scrolled down to the bottom drawer. And on the outside of that drawer was written the word unforgiveness. And a huge hand came and pulled out that drawer And when he did, out popped the face of my dad. And the Lord said to me, you have unforgiveness against your father. And you need to leave it, let it go. Right? Well, you know, I knew that growing up, although my dad was a wonderful provider, very successful, he grew up in uh, an alcoholic home, both parents, abusive verbally and otherwise. And so, you know, some of that stuff can carry over. You know what I mean? 
We've probably, uh, many people have experienced that. And so my dad was quick on the draw. I mean, you kind of walked on eggshells. You wanted to make sure you didn't set anything off. That's mama, kids, and everybody. Because if you did, you better head for the hills. And so I grew up with that tension. And I resented it. And I resented the way he treated my mother. And even though I'd been born again and baptized with the Holy Spirit, I kind of, I guess I just kind of pushed it down and didn't realize, you know what I mean? And at that moment, when I, I saw that, I said, Lord, I forgive my dad. I love my dad. I know, and I began to have compassion on my father, knowing where he came from and what he'd experienced as a child. And did you know that moment, my spiritual life, man, it took a leap forward. And, and I honestly believe when I released my dad that day, it opened the door for God to move in his life. And it wasn't uh, just a, maybe uh, uh, nine to 12 months later, my father had a supernatural visitation, a vision in his office with the Lord Jesus Christ. A curtain opened before him and he saw his whole life and all of his actions, supernatural replay. He came home crying, took my mother in his arms, said, please forgive me. And my mom said, am I going to die? <laughs> she thought maybe he was making amends. He said, no, honey, I've been wrong and you know all that. So, And man, I want to tell you, he was about 40 then. And he lived to 82, 42 years, the most sweet, tender person you could ever imagine, would cry, saying the blessing at Thanksgiving. I said, Dad, it's the blessing. Come on, you know. <laughs> he was just so grateful and so changed. Whoa! Somebody say, let it go. I used to travel with the Raymond Singers and band, my buddy Daryl Copes. Anybody know who Daryl? He was the big, long, tall, skinny bass player. Daryl Copes, he said, man, flesh is flesh no matter whose bones it's on. We all got it, right? Now, now listen, that doesn't mean you have to stay in an abusive situation. Be somebody's doormat. Entrust yourself to someone who is not trustworthy. But it does mean you have to keep your own heart void of offense, void of unforgiveness. Are you with me? Void of bitterness. You and Jesus. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, closing this point. Go after life, a life of love, as if your life depended on it, because it does. Woo! Somebody say, go team. Go team. I'm talking about keys that will optimize our spiritual endurance and help us finish well. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're going to keep our affection on things above. We're going to keep our heart with all diligence. We're going to keep ourselves in the love of God. And finally, and very briefly, number five, we're going to keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Galatians 6, 9 says, let's not grow weary in well-doing. Or while doing good, because in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You say, well, it's been a long time. You know what due season is, don't you? It's a little longer than you thought it was going to be, right? And it might be when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you might get that reward. But you're doing it for him. We've got a race to run. We've got a course to finish. We've got good works to accomplish. Let's let our testimony, guys, be the same as the Apostle Paul's. Here in 2 Timothy, is it 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8? Notice his testimony. He said, hey, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Finally. You might feel like that. <laughs> Finally. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Listen, if, if, if this race was easy, everybody would be running it. It takes the grace of God. It takes the determination of the heart, right? It takes a love for the Father. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And watch this, not to me only, but to all those who loved his appearing. Woo, that's us. A crown. You know, a crown is a symbol of honor. It's the emblem of a champion. 
It represents a place of dominion and rulership. That crown represents the place that God has prepared for you and for me. But guess what, guys? We got to contend for it. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Watch what Paul said. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So he said, run to win. Now, we're all going to get a prize, but that's the attitude. Let's run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. We do it to win an eternal prize. One translation says, we do it to win an incorruptible crown. Thank God for the blessings of the here and now, but nothing is going to compare to that day, to that incorruptible crown. Woo! But guess what? We've got to contend for it. We've got to run well, and particularly now in the closing of this dispensation. Let me give you two more scriptures. Revelation 3 and verse 11, Jesus himself, behold, I'm coming quickly. Now watch. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. They're not going to take your salvation. But he said, hold fast what you have that nobody takes your crown because that's a reward. Don't let the devil take it. Don't let the flesh take it. Don't let offense take it. Don't let personal discouragement and disappointment take it. Oh, let's forget yesterday. Let's leave it behind. Let's run the rest of this thing with fresh fire. What do you say? Let's press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to leave you with this admonition. It's from 2 Timothy and 1 Corinthians kind of put together. And this is what we're going to do. Are you with me? Be strong. In your own willpower? No. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Guys, this is what we have to do in this crazy world we're living in. Stand firm, unyielding, unrelenting, determined, and secure. Live your lives with an unshakable confidence, knowing that you prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord. And your union with the Lord will make your labor productive with fruit that remains. Can you say amen? So listen, whether you're serving in ministry, whether you're a layman in the church, whether you're an employer or employee, whatever facet or stage of life you find yourself in, remember first and foremost, we're children of God. Let's let our light shine. Let's impact people's lives for the kingdom of God. And let's run this race well and finish strong. What do you say? Everybody repeat after me. I will run my race. I will finish my course. I will keep my eyes on Jesus. I will keep my affection on things above. I will keep my heart with all diligence. I will keep myself in the love of God. And I will keep on keeping on. Amen.